This podcast is a peek behind the curtain for those of us who never had the pleasure of serving America in uniform. And we seek to highlight the pride, privilege, benefit, and sometimes sacrifice of that service that's unique to just 1% of the citizenry. While usually appreciated and often revered, their service is foreign to most, yet they represent threads woven into the very fabric of our culture. These are their stories. These are their demons. These are their lessons. This is the Carry the Load podcast. So my, my first question, given the, the, the content of, of uh, our discussion here, where were you on 9-11? I was actually, even though I'm born in Brooklyn, Todd, and, and grew up in New Jersey, uh, and my, we'll get into this a little bit later, perhaps, my brother worked in the South Tower on 81, exactly where the nose of Flight 175 came in until a fairly short time before when he had been transferred to Midtown. My sister worked at the World Financial Center, which is on the other side of West Street. She was on maternity leave. But I was far away. I was in Southern California working for CNN's uh, short-lived sports network, CNN Sports Illustrated, uh, with then uh, my girlfriend who would go on to become my wife. Uh, She's also from New Jersey. And that's where I was that day when everything unfolded. Uh, So obviously to have that happen in the Pacific time zone as opposed to the Eastern time zone. Uh, we were up early, but I don't think, we certainly didn't see what happened live with the first collapse of, uh, of the tower. So the, the fact that your brother was on the 81st floor in the South Tower, the second tower to be hit, by then you knew what was going on. And by then meaning that when the second plane hit, uh, uh, hit the South Tower, had you spoken to your brother yet? So my brother had worked for Fuji Bank, uh, which had offices, Todd, in, uh, in that part of the World Trade Center. He'd been there, I want to say at that point, for about a decade and a half. But I think two to maybe 10 weeks earlier, I may not have that exactly right, but about 10 weeks earlier, he was transferred from the South Tower office where he had sat, where his back would have been directly to Flight 175. Uh, And he, my brother, knew people who worked for Fuji who were ill. He was transferred to a Midtown location. And as a result of that, uh, he was not there that day by, you know, the providence of God. Um, And so when was the first time that you ever encountered Wells Crowther, the red bandana. What was the first time you ever heard about him? So I worked with uh, an acquaintance slash friend of Wells, a classmate of his at Boston College. I worked with him at ESPN. Uh, I was at ESPN for, you know, just shy of 20 years. And Drew Gallagher was Wells' classmate. Todd, you won't believe this. He wanted to tell this story uh, at the five-year mark, the fifth year anniversary of 9-11. And our bosses passed. Each year, he'd come back to them and say, this is an, an exceptional, extraordinary story. And it wasn't until the 10 year anniversary that Drew was given the green light to tell this story, which meant so much to him because it was someone he knew, someone he went to college with. And within that, Drew brought me into the fold and explained to me this story about Wells Crowther that I was not familiar with. We told the story in a, an ESPN feature that aired on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And the feature just had much more resonance, Todd. I, you know, when you put something out in the world, you know this, you don't know where a story goes, how it lands, what it means. Once you've done the story and put it out there, the world consumes it in its own way. 
but the country consumed it in a way that suggested to us that it was really resonant, you know, right up to the president of the United States, who we know was deeply moved watching the ESPN feature. And from there, the story only began to grow and grow with the platform of ESPN's telling. We were certainly nowhere near the first to tell the story, Todd. The story had been brilliantly and beautifully reported by the New York Times, but to tell it in a, in a I guess within a sporting context and with the passage of time, perhaps there was an audience there that was more receptive, ready for this story of one life lost and the lives that he saved. And, and at times, Todd, history, right, really is biography. We know that. But sometimes with time, biography gets lost. And history becomes about places and dates and statistics and numbers and trends and causes. But at the end of the day, at core, history is biography. It's the story of individual lives, whether they've coalesced together to the scale of millions and millions, as in some of our wars that have racked this world, or not. And this is a story of 9-11 through the lens of one life. So for those people who, uh, if we were trying to tease the book to this point, I think we've done a very good job of it. Which, by the way, I think is a phenomenal book. Absolutely loved Thanks, it. Tom. I think you did a, a, a fantastic job capturing so much emotion from so many different directions. But for those who are not familiar with the story, can you summarize that for their, for their purpose? So this is a story about Wells Crowther, uh, a young man who grew up in, in Rockland County which is a suburb of New York City. Uh, and it's a story about family, faith, community, sport, all of, if you will, if you will, the manifestations of what's now the cliche, Todd, right? That it takes a village to raise any of us. Wells was a, a great representation of this small village of Nyack, New York, just over the New York state line right on the Hudson River. His dad had been a volunteer firefighter at this beautiful old hook and ladder firehouse, Empire Hook and Ladder, literally down the hill and around the corner from where the family's house was. He idolized his father, Wells did, uh, Jefferson Crowther. And as fathers will do with sons, he would take his son to go and hang out at times at the firehouse and just sort of shoot the bull. So that seeped into him early. Another part that seeped into him early was faith. And on the way to church one morning, again, because he idolized his father, Wells saw his dad uh, put a pocket square into his jacket. Jefferson Crowther, a wonderful man, fairly formal in certain settings, a guy that dressed for church. And Wells, seeing this, wanted very much to have his own pocket square. Not having one, all the dad went back to his bedroom, came back, and gave him a red bandana. And for whatever reason, the mysteries of childhood, Todd, those things that become so important to us in a given moment, that become talismans for us, that red bandana, in different versions and iterations, became a constant in Wells' life. He would go on, he was a great athlete, great student, go to Boston College, play lacrosse there, where he always had the red bandana on his stick, on his book bag, on his equipment bag. He was a hockey player as well. Gets out of uh, college at BC, great student, and gets a job on Wall Street, writ large, on the 100 fourth floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center, working for Sandler O'Neill, an investment bank. And he had just made his transition from research to the trading desk, 
when 9-11 happened. Just prior to 9-11, he had called up his father with some trepidation in his voice, Wells did, to tell him something that shocked his dad, who was a banker. He told him, I might not want to do this for my career. I may want to become an FDNY firefighter. Wells had made it, Todd, into the precipice, no lie, of a profession that can yield a fortune. He had proven to Jimmy Dunn, the, 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 one of the principals there, that he was a guy that, in Dunn's view, had enormous potential, which is why he moved so quickly from research to training. Uh, but he didn't feel fulfilled. Had this, this moxie about him, that just this walk that you could just tell. Correct. Correct. Like a lot of athletes do. Like a lot of, like a lot of firefighters do. Like a lot of guys that grow up with this belief that it's not just about me. I want to be strong, not just to serve myself. I, I want to serve my community. I want to serve my team. Right? And incredibly, he calls his dad. He tells him, I'm thinking about this. His dad says, well, you know, whoa, wait a second. You could still volunteer. You got a great career. And ultimately, those instincts, when 9-11 happened, served wells and saved lives. As I understand it, he made multiple trips up and down the stairs. He found a safe passage after the planes had hit. He very easily could have gotten out. He, I mean, after, after getting people to safety the first time, I mean, it would be very easy for somebody to say, well, well, instinctually, I saved a few lives. I got to a safe place. Now I need to think about myself. That's not what he he's, did. Though. He's th that's not what he did. Think about it this way. And, and, and I'll, I'll end with the question that the book is sort of predicated on, Todd, as you know, you know, having read it. Here you are, you're sitting at your desk. You, you understand, okay, something's happened in the other tower. You're getting announcements saying, we're okay. The North Tower was the second to fall, but the first to be hit. He leaves a message that has become one of the most treasured possessions of, of his family. He left a message to his mom saying, hey, just want to let you know I'm okay. This is after the North Tower had been hit. And then Flight 175 uh, filled with fuel, um, descending, accelerating at 540 miles an hour, at the last second tilts its wings and cuts a swath between 78 and 84 in the south facade of the South Tower, blowing through the tower in an unimaginable scene of, of violent collision, explosion. The entire tower sways. Wells finds the only functional stairwell, the one that is still intact, that's up top now, not severed from where the plane has gone in. It's in the farthest corner from where the plane entered. He makes his way down to what was the sky lobby, the 78th floor where all of the express elevators would stop and take people to the highest reaches of the towers. That's a scene of fairly indescribable horror. There are scores of people who have been killed. There are dozens of people who are dying and seriously injured. Fire is shooting out of the elevator shafts into the, into the lobby where there's shattered glass, chunks of floor which have given way. And when Wells makes his way from 104 to 78, he goes into that lobby. He, he puts that red bandana around his mouth right, as a face covering that we're all now so familiar with as we've masked up through COVID. He, he puts almost like a bandit, if you will, and covers himself to try to guard against the smoke. He shouts to people 
if you can stand, do so now, and essentially beckons them to follow him. A small group does. One of those people who follows him notices he's carrying a woman, firefighter style, across his back, military style. He's carrying a woman who knows where he encountered her. We still don't know. He carries her down to 61 from 78 where the air is clear. And he says the only sentence that the first group of survivors that he helped ever heard him say, I'm going back up. They are met by firefighters on 49 or 50. They're ushered down. He takes a second group down. Again, knowing that the fires are continuing to burn. Who knows about the stability, vulnerability of the entire tower? But that impulse, incredibly, to go back up and save or lead to safety a second group. Then, Toddy, he does make his way ultimately down to the lobby where... And if for anyone who's hearing this, I'd love it if you would, at some point in your day, take 20 paces in any direction, maybe 25, and imagine that's the distance to the rest of your life. That's the distance to safety. And he doesn't do it. Instead, he goes to the mobile command post, which has been set up in the lobby, with the belief that perhaps he's the only person with any firefighting training who has witnessed what he's witnessed and made it down. And we know that he didn't leave and he went to that mobile command post because months later, after the tower's tragic collapse, Wells' remains are found, the only civilian among more than a dozen FDNY members who were all around that command post based on communication that the FDNY preserved. It revolves around this question, Todd, right? The question that I find central and and, and eternal. What would you do? What would I do? Ultimately, in what was the last hour of his life, And you make such a great point, Todd, a great point. You've already saved one group of people. The time that he took to then go back up, 20 minutes, half an hour, the time it took him to then make it to the lobby and still not leave and ultimately die when the South Tower came down. What would I do? And I got to believe, Todd, again, maybe I have these rationalizations. I'm in a different part of my life. Wells was two years out of college. He did not have children. He did not have a wife. He had sisters who were amazing and that he was devoted to. He had parents that he deeply loved. He had a great group of friends. But he felt that other calling. And that's the one he answered. In your research, all the people you talk to, friends, family, uh, co-workers, um, you know, who may have worked with him through the years, how many of them were surprised by his actions? Great question. Peggy Noonan, who's a, a, a sensational columnist for the Wall Street Journal, she called Allison after Allison Crowther, Wells' mom, after she read the book, and she asked Allison a question, Todd. How do you raise a hero? And Allison said the question embarrassed her. And I said, why did it embarrass you, Allison? By any definition, that's what you and Jefferson did. And think how wise is this Todd she said no it's what everyone did everyone who contributed to our son's path his life his character 
everyone who contributed to his failures and his successes. And that's why he reacted the way he did. So was she surprised? I don't know. I, I don't know that she would even walk to the line to answer that question. I think that Allison would find that question. She's almost too modest to answer it. But I think if she were telling the truth, she would say, no, we're not. Because he was the byproduct of all these people around him who helped shape him. Uh, he, uh, as I was reading it, I've got a background that has two mottos in my life that, have, that I've tried to use to guide me. Men for others, always faithful. And I kept coming back to those two saying, man, if there's ever anybody that lived it out, it was this guy. But he's not, not a choir boy. And, and this is what I mean, right? There's a scene in the book, Todd, you might recall, when he, he got into a fight in his dorm and he beat a kid pretty senselessly. Now, you know, if you can read the book to understand whether you think that was justified or not, um, but he took it into his own hands and in that case, <laughs> the call that Jefferson got from the middle, you know, from the middle, in the middle of the night was, you know, your son's in the hospital. Uh, you know, he got in a pretty serious scrape. Uh, we just want to let you know, you know, et cetera. And, you know, Jefferson, Todd, I know there's a lot of parents that this will, who may not agree with this. Jefferson had a simple motto when it came to if a fist got flashed. Never, never, you already know where I'm going. Never start it, but damn well finish it. Absolutely. And, and that's what he did. Um, he's also, you know, he's also someone who may have dated a couple of women at the same time. <laughs> he's, also, he's, he's not a perfect person. And, and you know, the wonderful thing about that, Todd, is his parents were the first to raise their hands to say, you know, saint, man, ain't no saints lived in this house. I can tell you that, which I think makes it relatable, makes it all the more universal, at least to me. I want to, I want to shift to you real quick and, and find out, I, as I was reading this, the one question kept coming up to me as it related to you. And that is, how did this change you as a person writing this story? That's a great question, Todd. And, and I think it changed through that question and my struggle to answer it. What would I have done? And ultimately, I made my reckoning with the answer by, by coming to terms with being so deeply grateful that I never had to answer it in the ultimate circumstance. So given that blessing, try to answer it the way Wells would have in other circumstances in my life, in my versions of life's trials and challenges, which can't begin to compare to the, the ultimate sacrifice that Wells made. But there are a lot of ways in which greater character, sense of commitment or selflessness, living for others, the great Jesuit motto, that to do that and have that manifest as often as you can, as a friend, as a son, as a parent, as a, as a co-worker, a colleague, as a member of a faith community, whatever that might be, that is at least how I'd like to think Wells' story will forever inspire me. I don't know if I'm a good enough man to say that it's changed me, but I know it's challenge to change. That will never go away. Was this a difficult story for you to write? I mean, given all the stories that you've done, and, you, and you've, you've been front row of some pretty, pretty incredible things. Was this difficult to write versus a lot of those? Yes. We, 
we did the we did the ESPN feature, uh, and again we were so grateful for Ling Young, one of the the people who well saved, who was willing to sit down and relive that terrible trauma, um, which she carries to this day. Uh, but the idea to write the book, Todd, was not mine. Uh, and a wonderful, wonderful publisher, Scott Moyers at Penguin Press, called me and said, do you think there's a book here? I said, I do. I don't think I'd be the person to write it. I'd never written a book before. And he said, I do think you could write it. I said, well, why don't we just start here? I'll go and I'll talk to the family and see if they would be open to doing it. And I met with Jeff and Allison and in essence, each suggested we'd be comfortable with you doing it. We know you. We saw the way the television feature came out. We felt that it honored the spirit of Wells' life, his sacrifice, his message, and the legacy that we're hoping to grow. And that's how the book took shape. Whenever you sit down, Todd, in any story, there are three, I think there are three guiding, my trinity in trying to tell a story goes as follows. Accuracy, empathy, and curiosity have sort of, and it took me a long time to come to that, to realize that. But now that I have, I think that talking with Allison and talking with Jeff, the more I wrote, the more I invested in it, I just, I became so incredibly concerned that they would believe I had lived up to those three values and that I had honored their immense trust. It's no small thing to sit there. It, no small thing to go through a manuscript with somebody, Todd, and have them, I mean, have them go over every quote, every anecdote, every part of the book that they contributed to, and they were bedrock building of the book. That I mean, that's a heavy responsibility for parents of a young man like that to, to say we trust, because trust is not a light word. We trust you to tell his story accurately. We trust you to paint him in an accurate light, but, a, but the right light. I mean, that's, again, I, I, I think that is probably one of the highest compliments that you could receive, I would think, as a journalist. But it's very nerve, it's nerve wracking, Todd. I mean, what, what, it very, you, uh, to sit opposite somebody to show them the pages for the first time. You know, you've spent a lot of time together. You've asked a great deal of a mother or father who've lost their only son. I, I remember, Todd, when I worked, uh, before I worked in sports, I was a local news reporter. I'll never forget, there was a, a military helicopter crash off the coast of Oregon. And I was a general news reporter. And I wanna say that five servicemen died. One of them lived in our viewing area, the family did. And here I was assigned to be that guy that knocks on the door. You know, very, very difficult assignment to try to do with humanity and empathy and in anything that feels appropriate in, in any measure. And I remember I knocked on the door, I'd done interviews of this nature before, but I knocked on the door and his mother answered. And I, I said who I introduced myself, I said who I was, I said, you have absolutely no reason to speak with us. I'm here to offer a venue for you to share what was so special to you about your child. The way he died 
is right now what people know. We just wanted to offer you a venue to talk about the way he lived. And she broke down, she did the interview. Uh, and I remember driving back to the station, I wept. I, I, I'll never forget. I've asked this question a bunch of times. I've made, this may have been the first time I'd ever asked it. I think, and again, I'm paraphrasing here, but I believe I asked her in, in the wake of, of great loss and trauma, people often use this word. They use the word surreal. Oftentimes people go to that word, Todd. It just, it, it's surreal. I asked her, what if anything has made it real? That's a risky question. Oh, and she just absolutely broke my heart when she said she went to the supermarket to try to get food for people in the community that she knew were going to come over and try to console the family and visit with them. And she was walking down the aisle and she saw a little box of a pistachio pudding mix. And that was her son's favorite dessert. And when she saw that little box, she realized, I don't need to buy that. And that made it real. Holy cow. What, when my wife, my family, uh, our two kids have heard me say this over and over, Todd, and this is, I mean, I, I get moved just saying it. What people bear and what people share is, a, is an endless wonder. We get caught up, Todd. I do. You do. We fight against it in marginal noise. That does, you know, sometimes it's necessary because you just got to get through your day. But the stuff that can sidetrack us and take us into the margins where if we could find a way to harness the out, the incredible strength that people possess in what they bear and the incredible generosity and wisdom in what they share, man, we'd be in a different spot. Well, that's the definition of empathy. The little box. And I knew I didn't have to buy that. And I made it real. That is a uh, an incredibly powerful uh, piece. So, I'm one final question for you as it relates to your journey here. How has it changed your view on humanity? And I, I think Todd, these are great questions, by the way. I'm, I mean, I won the lottery. I have you know, I had great, great parents. Um, you know, my parents have passed. I had great relationships with my parents. Uh, I'm in the business I'm in because of my brother, who I'm close with, um, you know, who lives one mile from me. My sister lives a few miles from me. Our kids are healthy. We're doing the best we can not to screw them up. Um, you know, my, my wife is three seats from Jesus and I get to do this for a living. Like I get to go to incredible events like the Super Bowl or the World Cup. Uh, and I get to tell these stories of people's journeys. And there's just a lot of genuine gratitude about that. But along the way in telling the stories, Todd, there are these endless lessons that are real, the, the specificity of human experience is boundless. 
and what people, again, what they share about those specifics, which is why I go back to the, the pistachio box. Um, again, back in Portland, before I did sports, uh, I, I did a, I spent 24 hours, Todd, in, in, a, in a NICU, in a neonatal intensive care unit. And I've told this story many times when, when people say, you know, well, what's a story you'll never forget? I was with an incredible shooter named Lyle Morgan, and we, we spent 24 hours there. And while we were there, an infant died. We made no, uh, we made no inquiry whatsoever to speak to the family, but we spoke to the doctors and nurses who had cared for the infant. The infant had been there for several months. And Lyle and I were just shocked at how devastated the doctors and nurses were. Not because, obviously they have enormous hearts to do what they do, Todd, but because it's what they do. Could they allow themselves to be this hurt, this damaged, this vulnerable, and still do what they do? And the short version is, several of them shared, Todd, think about this, the reason that this was so painful was because of the singularity of the family's ability to accept that the infant was going to pass. They kept faith, they prayed for a miracle, but they also had a capacity to accept. And within that, they came up with a very short list of what they thought it means, a handful of practical experiences that they could somehow engineer so that the infant really lived. They put ice cream on the infant's tongue. They had a puppy come in so that the infant could feel the puppy's fur. They had somebody come in and play guitar so the infant could hear music and on a beautiful day when it was sunny and windy, they unplugged the infant at some risk so that he could feel the sun and the wind. Everything was fine. He came back in. He returned to the ECMO suite. They had never encountered a family who had ever done that before. And thought, I can't, I, n I will never, ever forget that. what people bear and what they share and the specificity of human experience. <laughs> As a that's, parent, that yeah. is, what do, you, what, do, what do you think when you hear that? Well, I mean, uh, humanity, you know, it's, it's the very question I asked. I mean, you know, that, that's humanity. And, and I, I just, it's very, I don't understand why we have to wait. We as a society, have to wait until tragedies like 9-11, what happened with Wells, and, and, and obviously he was one story of, of many unbelievable stories that day. I don't understand why we have to wait until those tragedies to, to talk about the good. And I, I really, um, I loved the fact that so much good came out of this. It's just a question that I'd really like to explore, you know, on a personal level, because there's so much good, but we just don't put it out there enough. And the fact that, that Wells, how many, how many kids now are named Wells, a name that no one ever heard. It was so unique. And what, what does he have? Like hundreds of kids named after him now, right? Well, the book is now, you know, the, the book, the book came out at the 15th anniversary. So we don't have the latest number on it, but we had gone to the Social Security Administration at the time, and there were dozens and dozens of children named Wells. And as you said, Todd, you, I think you'd really have to go pretty far afield to have found any boy or girl with that name prior to people learning about Wells Crowther and the Red Bandana. What a, what a legacy, you know, that, that he's left. And, and, you know, I, I actually, you know, uh, I have one other topic I want to hit on, but I want to say thank you to you 
for bringing that to light. Uh, I understand that there were other stories out there before, but I think the fact that his family entrusted you to, you know, to put it out there the way you did, and again, you captured it, I think, um, you captured the human, and I, and I loved it. So I want to say thank, thank you. Now, you, Todd. You, you brought up Jimmy Dunn earlier, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't, because there's a connection here. And for those who don't know, Jimmy Dunn was the senior managing partner of Wells Firm at that time and has lately re-entered the news. Yeah. And I, I have to ask you, I mean, can, can you explain the backstory there first for everybody so they understand Jimmy Dunn, the Saudi Investment Fund, and the PGA? Yes. So Jimmy Dunn was Wells' boss at Sandler O'Neill, who was not in the office on 9-11 because he was trying to qualify at a course for, for the U.S. Mid-Amateur Championship, which is a really prestigious championship for non-professionals, one of the most prestigious in the country. And Jimmy is a tremendous player, a great player. He has carried with him every day since 9-11 that circumstance, that fact that he wasn't in the office because he was on a golf course. And when he returned as now the lead principal responsible for rebuilding the firm, uh, there's just no other way to say it, Todd, to, to what Jimmy Dunn did in the wake of 9-11 is st staggeringly heroic. He put I, I may have the number, I, I don't want to shortchange it, but he put nearly a hundred children of those who were lost in the firm on 9-11 through college. Like, let that land. He went to more than, I, I don't know, a number of funerals. Jimmy Dunn went and rebuilt the firm. The firm has sold very recently, but he rebuilt the firm to greater heights than it had ever achieved. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anybody who, is, who worked with greater energy to save and rebuild his immediate professional community than Jimmy Dunn in the wake of 9-11. Right. As you mentioned, Todd, he's re-entered uh, in, in a very, I think, unforeseen way. He's re news cycle. He just this week, as we record this, testified uh, before Congress with uh, Hurley, Ed Hurley. Uh, these are PGA Tour board members being questioned by the Investigations Committee, the subcommittee in Congress about the PGA Tour's deal with the PIF, which is the investment fund um, so for, that Saudi Arabia controls. Jimmy Dunn has been a huge figure in golf, but as an amateur and as a guy that professional players love, play with, spend time with, golf is an enormous part of his life. Um, and it's no surprise that he had a very tight connection with Jay Monahan, the head of the PGA Tour. And with that, the existential threat that live golf, which is again funded by the Saudi Arabia's sovereign investment fund, uh, the cost of the litigation, without getting into all the details, Todd, it, a deal was ultimately struck with the PGA Tour and live golf. Jimmy Dunn was one of the key brokers and catalysts for that deal. And that has hurt. <laughs> That has hurt some of the, the families who were involved with 9-11. I mean, hurt is almost too mild a word. Uh, betrayed would maybe be the better word that some have felt. Um, and Jimmy Dunn has gone on the record as saying he genuinely does not believe anyone he's dealt with has had any, had any connection to 9-11. None. 
And that in this most powerful quote, Todd, which I'm sure you saw, if they did, he would kill them himself. Got my attention. He would wait. Yes, I'm sure it did. Uh, still, Jimmy Dunn has faced a lot of criticism, I, uh, again, from those families. But to me, uh, Jimmy Dunn is an amazing, amazing man, a man I deeply admire. Uh, I, and I, the good that he has done, I, I think, is, it can, is unquestioned, the good that he's done in his life. Well, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. Here. That 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 certainly makes me feel better, given what happened in the 20 years beyond that date, and all the friends that I lost. Um, you know, because they all tie together. They all tie together. And so, you know, I, I'd love to hear your final answer to this. Given what we just talked about, given where we started with Wells, do you think that Wells would have felt betrayed by any of this? I, uh, I do not. And it goes back to, I, I like to think it goes back to what's at core here, right? And that's faith and being for others. And I think allowing others to experience your own grace, because that's the grace you believe you receive through your faith. So I, I, I don't think he would, feel, I don't know, of course, I don't think he would. And I don't know, Todd, that someone that lays down his life for people whose names he didn't even know is going to be that quick to feel betrayed by or judge harshly someone who nurtured him and cared about him. Tom, thank you. I am um, I'm honored, I'm humbled that you have taken the time to sit down with us. Uh, love your insight, love your work. Uh, again, thank you very much. And for those who have not read the book, The Red Bandana, man, love it, love it. Todd, the, the work that you guys do, and this is a term I use a lot, but the, the good that you put in the world is awesome. And yes, we can get caught up in opinion and we can talk about headlines and we can talk about the current event of the day, but those things tend to fade. It's the good that we put in the world that we hope is the most perpetuating thing we do with our lives. And Todd, the fact that you're a busy dude and you take the time to put that good out there, I'm the one that's grateful for the opportunity. I hope we get a chance to meet in person one day, Tom. Thank you very much for your time and all your words. Fantastic stuff. If this resonated with you in the least, please subscribe and like, and please, please, please share it with at least one person. These are the stories that make us uniquely American. These are the stories that preserve the integrity of our nation.